Welcome to Start the Week with Wisdom. My name is Bridget Burns. I'm the Executive Director of the University Innovation Alliance. Hi, I'm Paul Fain. I'm a contributing editor at Inside Higher Ed. And each week I partner with a journalist to sit down and have a conversation with a sitting college president or chancellor to better understand what it's like to navigate these challenging times, hopefully gather some insight, perspective, and perhaps some inspiration for those of us stuck at home. This is Weekly Wisdom. This week, we're excited to bring you a conversation with the University of California Riverside Chancellor Kim Wilcox. Chancellor Wilcox has led the institution since 2013, and he was a founder of the University Innovation Alliance. And uh, as you may know, UCR is one of the few universities in the country where outcomes are equal across race and income, which is definitely a rare feat in higher education. Chancellor Wilcox, how are you? Great, great to be here. So to start off, uh, I can't believe it, it's almost October. Uh, time is kind of hard to keep track of these days, but I, I've heard from a couple of folks today who feel like starting to settle into a rhythm for this term. Um, you know, it's hard to kind of even ask that question because the rhythm is different than it's ever been. But do you feel that way? Do you feel like you're 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 hitting your stride in a way that things feel normal? Uh, yes. Uh, importantly, Riverside's on the quarter system, so classes started today for us. Oh. So the rhythm is, but but your your bigger. Uh, scan is still, uh, I think, apropos. Um, the middle of March, when everything went chaotic, it was like just day to day, day to day, day to day. And and even through the rest of the spring, I think most of us found a rhythm. Uh, we had the summer, uh, not just here in Riverside, but talked to colleagues around the country to, to kind of think more deliberately about the, the fall, uh, whether it was research support or uh, course offerings or whatever it might be. Uh, and I think that's more the the rhythm uh, that I, you're referring to this kind of um, planning and organizational and administrative rhythm. The, the great, one of the great things about universities is we have a cycle. We begin a year, we end a year, we have commencement, we have convocation, we have regular breaks. Uh, and so uh, I think the rhythm is partly now getting back to that, that regular cycle. Kim, I'm curious, uh, you know, a lot of other campuses have already started and you got to watch what they went through and perhaps might have benefited from seeing that example. Are there any things that you changed or adapted or that you gleaned from others' experience um, that has informed you coming into the fall term that you know really was a benefit? Um, mostly what I would say was affirmation. We took a pretty uh, cautious, some would say conservative approach from the beginning in our planning for the fall. Um, I, we had a, a faculty and a committee headed by the provost that early on decided some principles for the fall in terms of instruction. And one was everyone deserves a safe option, which meant that even if you're in a class of 30 students and you're the only student who doesn't want to go back to face to face because you live with a family member who has health concerns or whatever it might be, you deserve a safe option. And once you have that as a, as a um, premise, then pretty much everything has to be at least a remote option. So we have some face, very few face-to-face -face classes, but even those have a remote option. Uh, what we found as we watched the fall semester unfold across the country was, um, I think some of our colleagues weren't cautious enough in their planning. Uh, we did get to learn about uh, testing. We had a testing plan in place. Um, we, we learned even more to be even more focused on potential hotspots undergraduates in, in aggregate living is clearly a focus um, and that became clearer and clearer. So we learned some things, but mostly it was an affirmation. You know, one of the questions that I think everybody's wrestling with, we all know that the, these crises have in, in disproportionately impacted uh, black and Latino students, uh, families from lower income backgrounds. Um, you know, as an institution that does particularly well with achievement gaps, how concerned are you about uh, some of the most vulnerable students bearing the brunt of this challenging time? Um, I'm very concerned. It's one of the things that is on the top of my list when I talk with um, most people off campus, particularly policymakers and, and legislators and the rest. Um, we've, we've, we've learned a lot in the pandemic, and one is that the pandemic has amplified inequity, whether that's in healthcare or income or social programs. Uh, and so with a population on our campus that's over half Pell eligible students, um, over half first generation students, uh, we have a, a group of students who are already 
um, I don't want to say at risk, but already challenged in in ways of support that other students around the country may not be. And um, this pandemic, of course, has meant we've had to redouble our efforts on campus through our food pantry and, and other support programs to do it the best we can. Uh, but that's a huge challenge. And I hope it's one of the messages that lives with us after the pandemic. I hope that this period of um, just so obvious, uh, the inequities across the country in higher education and elsewhere, uh, that we as a nation will be, will be better at addressing these realities so that, heaven forbid, in the next pandemic, we won't be in the same same situation. That's helpful. I'm curious about, so you have led, at, 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 you've been in the institutional leadership for a very long time, whether it was being a provost at Michigan State, whether it was your time in Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> I can get on my driver's and, license. <laughs> yeah. So you have a lot of experience with this and you've experienced uh, highs and lows in that time. But I'm curious about what it's like to lead now that feels uniquely different um, as people are trying to figure out how they can like, you know, up is down, down is up. How, how, what's it like to lead in this moment? I'm just curious if you can reflect for us on any differences that you've noticed uh, about how you have figured out what the North Star is or how you inspire people. Um, how, how are you grappling with that? Wow, great question. Um, I counted up the other day, this, I've had, this is my sixth um, budget cut. My first was an assistant professor at the University of Missouri. Uh, so I was more the recipient of <laughs> Uh, uh, wisdom and, and perspective and direction on budgets than, than the purveyor. Um, this one is unique. Uh, it may be larger than any I've seen, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it has hit the entire university in most years, most prior budget cuts. Uh, the auxiliary operations were pretty much intact. We still had students living in residence halls. We still were providing meals to people every day. Uh, this one, that was the first group that got hit. We emptied our residence halls and closed down most of our dining facilities, uh, maintained as best we could the staff on payroll as long as we could. Uh, so there's a, a, a broader hit uh, than else other times. This is also unique in terms of the impact on the rest of society. This is not an easy time to be raising tuition, which was a solution in many other budget cuts um, over the years. Simply not a, a, a socially responsible option in this environment with families uh, struggling as they are. Uh, so that makes this uh, different. Um, the, uh, the, you can take some heart, well, I love it. you can take some heart and some disappointment, I guess, from past budget cuts. Uh, I think in every one of those past five, in my experience, we never returned to the same level of funding we had before. So we have to go into this with our eyes wide open. Uh, we can't be naive about what the future will hold, that everything will bounce back and the state funding will return and everything will be it, it has never returned in my 40 years, I guess now in, in higher education. Um, so that's, that's one piece. But the other more heartening piece is uh, our universities continue to thrive. Um, that first budget cut was almost 40 years ago. Um, and all these universities are bigger and stronger and better than they were then even. So the, the trajectory remains upward, but we have to be pretty honest about uh, how to manage through this. I take great heart just watching what's going on on the campus. We're, remember, we're, we're a, an industry of the mind and you carry your mind around. Like Abraham, Abraham Lincoln had it under his hat. Uh, you carry your mind with you. And while we're not all together in the same way that we, we wish we were or we used to be, we still have our minds um, and we still have the opportunity to bring along students into this collection of scholars and, and learners. Uh, that's a pretty special thing. And, and if you stop and appreciate that, it's hard not to be inspired. You know, on budgets and a host of issues, I gather you have had some tough decisions to make and tough decisions to make in a short time frame. I just wonder in, in the last few months if the decision making process for you has changed at all. Uh, the way you all do it, the folks you bring in, the speed that you make tough calls, is, is it how, how different is it than previous times? Yeah, it's, it, uh, it's, it actually is quite different in that regard. Um, I'm not a fan of this model, but oftentimes when we see a, a budget cut coming, universities will put together a blue ribbon panel, never a red ribbon panel, always a blue ribbon panel, uh, to advise on the budget strategy. Um, I've generally been uh, not a proponent of that model. I've always asked myself, why would we, in a time of reduced resources, 
stop and invest more resources into a process to decide how to reduce resources. Um, let's instead rely on our existing uh, strategies and, and people. Uh, we did that at Riverside. We have a budget advisory committee that proffered recommendations. Um, and also, of course, in this climate, we simply had so many other things going on. How are we going to continue classes? What are we going to do about research? That it almost was impractical to think about a different strategy. Um, hindsight being 2020, I think we learned that that, that process wasn't quite well tuned to this task in a pandemic era. Um, we did we got good input, but we didn't get quite the the level and time for analysis that we might have wanted to. Uh, so we're working on that now. Uh, we've given our campus a two year planning time frame. We're asking for budget reduction plans that span two years, which will hopefully give everybody a, a broader frame on their own unit, but also allow us centrally to think about how to bridge across the different timelines across the units. Uh, so yeah, we have refined our thinking as it's gone along, but the, yeah, I, I joked back in March, uh, I yearned for the days of a simple 15% budget cut. Um, said we had a pandemic, we had calls for the funding of police, we had a thousand other things that were swirling around us. Absolutely. One of, one of the things I um, always am curious about is, as a leader, how do you make sure that you have all the information that you need to make decisions? And one of the um, things I always notice is that really great leaders try and you know, they try and get all of the perspective, but it's rarely something you can get in a formal meeting. Like you really benefit from those kind of end of the meeting, like so-and-so is gonna catch it at the very end and just, you know, put, put a bug in your ear or you get a chance in the hallway. And that, that kind of information is always really helpful. And, and now that we're all on Zoom, I'm just curious, like how do you set yourself up to have the kinds of conversations that will allow you to really kind of know kind of what's going on in people's in minds and hearts and like, you know, what's the T, <laughs> if I may. Um, yeah. Are there any things you're doing to help you with that? Um, great question. I, you're listening, Bridget, you're exactly right. I, I, even sitting in a meeting, you can see eye checking. Who's looking, uh, somebody says something, somebody else, oh, did you hear that? Uh oh I mean, it, on Zoom, everybody's looking at the same screen. I mean, they may do some side chatting that you can't see, uh, but there's a there's a social context, a social fabric that's uh, really pretty benign in this uh, set. I think we, and I'm just saying broadly, not just Riverside, but we as an industry, we as a society have tried to uh, account for that a lot with data. Let's get the data out, let's share the data. Uh, but I was just talking with the provost a moment ago, the data are the data, but you gotta have a conversation about the data. and why this makes sense and doesn't make sense relative to the frame of, of concern that the individual uh, participant has. So um, I, the, the, now the upside, there's always an upside, the upside of, of Zoom is you can get to things pretty easily. So I've actually been attending lots of classes that I never would have gotten to uh, in the old days because I can just click on a button and drop into a class for five or 10 minutes. I'll, in fact, I'll please send this out, faculty members invite me. Uh, but I get there and I get to talk to some students and I, I let them ask me some questions, make some responses. Um, and so can get a flavor of things that uh, was hard to get uh, in a personal way before. We get, we're get we getting better attendance at many of our meetings, uh, particularly student attendance at meetings uh, than we ever had before as well. If you're sitting at home in your bedroom and you got nothing to do but go out and watch TV with mom, you might as well click on the meeting with the chancellor at 6.30. Um, so there, are, there, there have been some upsides, but I feel exactly your, what the nature of your question. It's a different kind of social interaction um, that doesn't have the same kind of, and yeah, we get, you get to a meeting early, you sit there and look at a screen with two or three other people and you can do a little chatting, but it's not nearly the same as catch me in the hallway afterward. That's a really interesting uh, conversation point. It makes me think it'd be a good story for us. Uh, but uh, you know, changing gears here, uh, and speaking, you know, beyond Riverside, uh, the issue of low-income students and and making sure that they they can keep on track. What are some of the interventions you think could make a difference? Whether uh, state, federal policy, you know, what what do we need to be doing now to make sure that uh, something you don't have a, an exodus, frankly, of, of students who can least afford to leave? Yeah. Um, the, the Lots of parts to your question. Um, I think we have to, I, I, at the University of California, certainly UC Riverside and the state of California have to take some credit for the support systems we have in place. Uh, that's a lot of what our past success has been. So um, I'm proud of the fact that the legislature has stood by 
most of those student-oriented programs. Um, and that's key. We, we can't backslide from where we are. Uh, then it's a matter of, of kind of redoubling. Uh, I, a lot of people ask us how we are so successful with students' uh, progression to degrees here at Riverside. And, and we've, we've uh, got a, a simple perspective on that. Generally, people right away think of programs. Let's put a program in place to do this or to do that. Programs are important. They, they serve a, a key role. Uh, but for us, it's the third, th third thing in the list. Uh, the first is the culture. You have to have a culture that embraces, supports, and, and uh, is committed to these students and their success. And when I say these students, I mean the students of your, of your university. Uh, the second uh, key element is having the people who are committed to the culture. And the two are reinforcing, of course. With that culture, we recruit more and more faculty and leaders who want to be part of this world. Once you have that platform, uh, a culture and a committed group of people who want to make sure that all students succeed, then you can start to think about programs. And the programs that work, of course, for one student generally work for all the students. Um, and that's kind of the mindset we've brought to this. We've redoubled, like I said, our, our targeted programs like food pantry and, and um, we have a special, I went to a, a, a new uh, me, a organizational meeting of uh, students and faculty staff who are organizing a uh, Highlander connection to help entering students connect. And they describe themselves as a vibrant remote community. And I offered, you know, if this was a year ago and you got invited to a vibrant remote community, you'd think of a small artist gallery, a colony rather, up in the Sierra Nevadas, a skiing in the winter and tourists in the summer, and that'd be a vibrant remote community. Well, now vibrant remote community means something quite different. It's thinking about how to connect people in a real engaging sense uh, through this new medium. So we're, we're exploring all those pieces, but you got to have the basis of uh, people and culture that are committed to it. Yep, we're getting comments from folks. Culture and people are so important. It's the foundation of student success. Um, we also have some uh, some questions that have come in. Um, oh, I, I gotta go. Okay. <laughs> um, so someone was asking now it's, it, you have a different relationship with athletics you know uh, but someone was asking about uh, the update on the possibility of discontinuing athletics from the budget recommendation after the two-year plan is that a UCR thing I'm, or is this just uh, yep yep um, our budget advisory committee uh, got a lot of feedback from particularly faculty members on campus uh, that we should look at uh, reducing or uh, many eliminating athletics uh, the the committee already had a one of their principles of prioritizing um, the academic core. And so that's a, a point of discussion right now on the campus is um, really the, the return on investment on, on athletics, the costs versus the uh, benefits. Um, I'm not one who wants to close our athletics department, trust me, but uh, we've got to find uh, serious budget savings in, the, in this. In the, in the coming it makes months. total sense. Yeah. Completely understand that. And as I understand it, there's some other schools having similar conversations, just not as publicly, apparently. Yeah, of course. Yep. So, you know, I, I often hesitate to go here, but I feel like, you know, we're, we're at a point in the crisis where it, it maybe doesn't feel wrong to ask, is it driving some change that's good, some, some change that you hope, and you mentioned uh, looking at equity in a different way, and I, I actually think that there's some hope for that, um, but, you know, what, what would you like to see stick around that's happened in the last few months? Well, um, I, I talked a little bit about dropping into classes. Um, I, think, I think we will have a, uh, a different perspective collectively on the blend between face-to-face -face and distance. And right away, most people think of classes when you think of face-to-face -face distance. As, as an industry, we were further ahead on the class side than we were on most anything else. Most campuses are full of hybrid courses. Um, most campuses have online degrees and all the rest. We didn't do much of that on the administrative side. Um, and we all um, we all know that there are some administrators and supervisors who don't like people to work from home, in part because you can't trust them. They might not be working. Uh, when, in fact, the people who aren't working at home were the same people who weren't working in the office uh, in many cases. Um, so I think there's an opportunity for us to think more holistically about this face-to-face -face and distance stuff, uh, not just on the in the classroom setting, but across the rest of the, of the university itself. And in our engagement with others uh, across the community, we get, we uh, just like we have good participation in committee meetings, we have pretty good participation in public meetings now too. 
people who do we want to get dressed up and go to the lecture at five o'clock? Well, no, you can just click on and sit and, and watch and enjoy. Uh, so I think that will be part of it. I think there'll be some some institution or some industry wide cost savings in terms of infrastructure, um, in terms of office spaces and the rest that will come from that. Uh, we haven't realized as much on the instructional side for lots of reasons, good and bad. But I think it's going to be an easier uh, piece to do with some, some hot seating and in the administrative side. So, oh. so I'm I'm curious about uh, keeping your eye on the ball. So as a president, as a chancellor, as a provost, like it, just in, in any of these jobs, um, it feels like folks are just getting hit daily, minute by minute with more demands, decision fatigue is high. And I'm just curious about now that you've been, you've been leading for a long time, I feel like you've probably figured out a rhythm of how you make it so that you are focused on the big picture and really what you should be focused on, whatever that is, as opposed to the drama of the day or the chaos of the day. And I'm just wondering if you could give some advice for folks at home, because it feels like the news hits keep coming and it's really difficult to kind of, you know, settle the ball a bit. And I'm wondering if there's anything that you do personally in your mornings or otherwise that really makes it so that you can have a sense of clarity before you head into your day. Oh, uh, tough question, Bridget. Um, you know, it is like so many people I'm sure who are watching right now. It's a crazy world. I get up. Well, I, I try to work out in the morning. I don't always do that. But then you just come down and here you are one floor away in the same building 24 seven weeks on end. Um, I have seen oh, back to the uh, question about rhythms. I've, I've seen that rhythm in the people I work with, even though most of it's by Zoom. Um, the immediate crisis in March, people were running frenetically. Then we settled in a little bit. Then people got tired. People got a little testy with each other. And then recovered a little bit. Uh, we're back to a testy, grumpy period right now, in, in my estimation. I spend a lot of time suggesting, advising, require, recommending, can't require uh, people to take time for themselves. I've tried to do the same, but again, it's hard in the COVID. You can't just get on a plane and go someplace and unwind in the same ways. Um, I, I try to myself, uh, take as much of the weekend as I can, uh, just because I, I need it. Uh, like I, yeah, I'm talking to everybody who's doing the same thing. You sit here in front of the screen from seven 30 in the morning until five 36 o'clock at night. And I am beat. There's no receptions to go to in the evening. There's no travel. You'd think I'd be refreshed. Uh, but this is a pretty fatiguing piece. So I spend a lot of my time, uh, kind of talking with my colleagues about themselves, um, trying to talk about taking time and, and making time. Um, you know, I try to do it myself and I, I think I do a pretty good job at it, um, but there's there's not enough time in the day to get done what needs to be done, what doesn't. In terms of the, the bigger piece, yeah, I scan, of course, uh, inside higher ed every day, uh, but some other, some other <laughs> media as well. I try to, to not dig too deep into a lot of it. Uh, the arc of those stories, you know, the COVID rise was students came back to, to campus and the reductions as they developed better testing. I mean, there's kind of an arc to that. You don't need to know what every single school did and how many additional cases they had and how many they got rid of. Um, you can get mired down in all kinds of details, but to have a sense of what this arc is to the extent to which it can inform your general trajectory is, is how I approach most of the media these days, just because there is so much of it. And at the same time, we've got some pretty major national pieces going on in the same way. Um, it's the arc that's more important to me. That's great. And uh, I just want to, before we wrap our last question, as you said, there's no receptions to go to. Um, I've been talking with Ed Ray occasionally, just checking on him since he retired. And he's gotten really skinny. And he said it's specifically because there's no receptions. And he's like, I don't know. There's like no, I, I, all he does is eat soup now. And he, he's just like, he's like, there's, I, I really don't get invited in anything. And I'm like, yeah, nobody else is. Yeah, we're all, don't worry. We're getting COVID fat for other reasons. 20 pounds, 20 pounds. <laughs> Oh, well, good. You have the opposite. No, That's no awesome. receptions, no travel, no bad uh, lack of exercise on the plane and all that other stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess a university leader might buck the national trend of the, the COVID, uh, you know, packing on the pounds. You know, uh, and you all are different than other folks for a lot of reasons, I think, as a college Better leader. Better looking, you were thinking? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I just want to clarify that for everybody. Listening. You know, uh, 
<laughs> well, to that end, you all are very positive. You, you know, you have to be you have to be a believers in higher ed, um, and you have to really push forward when it's looking hard. As you mentioned, we may be going into a testy period as a country. It does feel like that, and it's hard to believe, you know, the summer wasn't that. But you know, as you as you look ahead and 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 you know, deal with folks across the institution who are really struggling with this being a long haul and far from over. What keeps you hopeful, and, and how do you how do you keep pushing ahead? And, and what's, what are sort of the messages that you like to bring to folks to keep them pushing ahead? Um, part partly, it's just uh, again this longer trajectory of universities and our university. But I'm here to tell you, it's everybody I talk with. Um, it's the faculty senate leadership. It's the student body leadership. It's it's students in class. It's um, I live of course on campus, so I was out. Yeah, we, we moved. Uh, residents all move in. And I'm out on my bicycle, meeting parents and students and custodial workers who are keeping the grounds clean during the move in. And um, everybody is doing all they can to make sure that things are as good as they can be. Uh, good as they can be for our university, as good as they can be for the broader community, um, for their families. Um, there's an awful lot of great news. Oh, okay, here's one for you, Bridget. Um, you know, Sam uh, uh, Krasinski um, from the office, can't remember his first name now, um, has some good news on YouTube. Well, our communications office uh, decided that would be my welcome back and message to the students. So I did some good news, not out yet, but uh, some good news about the campus. Um, there's so much good news that, yeah, it's the bad news catching the, the headlines, but every one of those people on campus has some good news to tell. Uh, they've done a great job of keeping the place running and moving ahead uh, at a time when most of the, again, most of the broader conversations about all of our problems. So that's where I get my inspiration. And, and Diane, my wife walks on campus all the time. She comes back every day with a new story of somebody she ran into, um, oftentimes a worker on campus what they're doing, what they've done, what they want to get done. Uh, it's pretty hard not to be inspired. Absolutely. Thanks. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Chancellor Wilcox. We really appreciate it. Uh, the time that you spent with us today, the wisdom that you've shared with everyone. And I'm so grateful that, uh, you know, I gave everyone a teaser that they might get a chance to hear your laugh. And so I'm glad that you actually delivered. <laughs> oh, um, I, didn't know, I didn't know somebody told the joke. I missed it. But I, <laughs> <laughs> you're your laugh is uh, it's 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 globally famous. It's the most uh, it's the most famous laugh in higher ed, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. um, <laughs> it's a did, niche. I guess I'll have to take. <laughs> um, so it's one of the many joys of having meetings with you. Uh, so for folks at home, uh, we hope that this has given you a bit of inspiration and perspective to fuel the rest of your week. And be sure to join us next Monday when we're joined by the president the new president of Oregon State University, King Alexander, same time, same location. So we hope that you have a wonderful week. And thanks again, Paul, as always, a wonderful co-host. And we will see you all very soon. Thanks all. Bye-bye.